The epic Ramayana has always occupied a special place in the Indian cultural context. So etched is the legend in the minds of the Indian psyche that it lends itself to every art form, traditional or modern, of the country. The days preceding the Sera witness a surfeit of street corner dance dramas featuring episodes from the epic, the Ramlilas. And of course, there have been numerous films on the subject. Ramayana was also one of the most successful television serials ever in India. And now comes the latest, an offering from a local English group, The Legend of Ram, Prince of India. Complete with modern pyrotechs and visual gimmickry, an area of performance that is spread over acres, an audience that is transported from one set to the next, the play is one of the most ambitious productions witnessed in the history of Indian theatre. I started off with a budget of 30 lakhs. I've hit over 72 today. I'm still 20 lakhs short of my budget. Amir Raza Hussain has been labelled as Delhi's king of bedroom farces. His stage door would stop at nothing to have their audience in peals of laughter. And while the highbrow paparazzi of the capital sniggered at what he had to offer, ironically, his plays ran to substantial attendance, often comprising the same people. That this seemingly happy-go-lucky member of the low-profile Delhi stage could envision grandeur at this scale has come as a surprise. Yet those involved with the play are convinced that should the experiment be successful, the event will be of significance to Indian stage history. The audience will have, uh, like it and they're willing to pay about two grand to, to buy a ticket to see this. It's, in, it's a sure enough indication that things are working for theatre. If that happens or not remains to be seen, but the scale of the production is indeed impressive. The audience, seated on giant platforms, are carted from one area to the next on rails provided by Northern Railways. The grandiose sets are the work of art director Bijan Das Gupta, and significantly, it is for the first time that Tanushri Shankar has choreographed to music not composed by husband Anand Shankar, but Ustad Amjad Ali Khan. What is exciting, I think, for us, I don't know how exciting it is for her, is that the first time she has choreographed numbers which are to music not by her husband, and are to music by Ustad Amjad Ali Khan. Yet for Amir, this seems to be one serious attempt at theatrical greatness, and what else could provide it but the great epic done with great elan? Yet his competence to provide an interpretation of this great work of literature has come in for criticism, a charge Amir is dismissive of. Here we are not dealing with history, we are dealing with someone's text which has been put to dialogue and presented as a play. <coughs> so, there is no, it, so there is no interpretation required. The prince. Of course the play itself seems like a conscious attempt to deviate from the earlier versions of the epic. The costume designs are a complete departure from the looks made famous by Raja Ravi Varma, though the sets seem to conform to the styles of Bollywood. However, given the movement, the play of lights, the choreography and the music, it becomes a pleasant experience for the viewer. It's very well brought out and it's completely innovative. I've just never seen anything done like this before. However, in spite of the genuineness of the effort, whether the play's oversimplistic dialogue and audience-friendly script amounts to robbing the ancient saga of its meaning and intensity is a point for critics to ponder and argue about. The Election Commission has indicted the Union Minister for Welfare, Mr. Sitaram Kesri, and the Union Minister of State for Food, Mr. Kalpanath Rai, for what the Commission called blatantly violating the Model Code of Conduct. The Commission has demanded an explanation from the ruling Congress party about alleged deviation from the Code of Conduct by the two ministers. The charges against them pertain to taking such steps as would, in the Election Commission's view, influence the sections of the electorate to vote in favour of the ruling party. The assembly elections in the snow-clad Himalayan state of Sikkim on the 16th of this month were marked by a huge turnout, about 81%. The polling was generally peaceful with no reports of violence or clashes between rival parties. In fact, the election time was like fiesta time in Sikkim. 
The high point of the polling was the enthusiastic presence of women who form nearly half of the electorate. Likewise, in the coastal state of Goa too, polling was mainly free and fair. The voter turnout was estimated to be about 70%. Long queues of men and women alike could be seen in both rural and urban areas. The Supreme Court has ruled that the Tamil Nadu Reservation Act 1993, providing for 69% reservations in government jobs and educational seats, cannot be enforced even after its inclusion in the Constitution's ninth schedule, which aims to validate the Act with retrospective effect. This was indicated by the Supreme Court judges, Mr. Justice B.P. Jeevan Reddy and Mr. Justice S.C. Sen, who refused to accept the Tamil Nadu government's plea seeking the review of the Apex Court's order of the 18th of August this year, which had directed the state to follow the limit of 50% reservations with regard to medical college admissions in this academic year. The chairman of the United States Foreign Affairs Subcommittee for Asia and the Pacific conceded during his visit to the valley that he found that people were suffering because of militancy. He also admitted that all hands in Kashmir militancy were not local. Mr. Ackerman said his delegation would like dialogue to replace violence and would pursue this goal through discussions with fellow congressmen and others back home in the United States. The Kashmiri migrants at the Purkhu camp in Jammu appealed to the United States to persuade Pakistan to refrain from inciting terrorism and violating human rights in the valley. The chief of army staff, General Bipin Chandra Joshi, died after a heart attack in New Delhi on the 18th of this month. His term was to have continued until December next year. General Joshi, the head of the Chiefs of Staff Committee, was the first army chief to have died in harness. General Joshi was a recipient of the Param Vishisht Seva Medal. His mortal remains were consigned to the flames with full military honours in New Delhi cantonment on the 19th of this month. Defence experts say that while the death of a serving army chief is unfortunate, it will not affect the preparedness of the force to take up any task because its essential functions are effectively carried out by five regional army commanders, one of whom would succeed General Joshi now. The 14th India International Trade Fair got underway this week at Pragati Maidan in New Delhi. Nearly 3,500 exhibitors and 19 countries are participating in the fair, whose theme is sustainable development. Inaugurating the fair, the Prime Minister, Mr. P.V. Narasimha Rao, emphasized that the development of key industries in all sectors should be compatible with environmental protection and take social factors into account. Air Chief Marshal S.K. Kohl invited the country's private industry to contribute to the nation's security needs. He was speaking at a seminar on indigenization of Air Force requirements organized jointly by the Indian Air Force and the Confederation of Indian Industry. Air Chief Marshal Kohl pointed out that a closer interaction between industry and the Defense Department would help the armed forces avail of the state-of-the-art technology which they otherwise would have to import. In a step expected to boost industrial growth, the government proposes to allow duty-free import of all capital goods. However, importers will have to export seven times the value of the imports. The government plans to continue the existing export promotion of capital goods scheme with its obligation of exporting four times the import value of capital goods during a five-year period. The Delhi High Court allowed the controversial film Bandit Queen to be shown to a screening committee of the Film Federation of India, currently viewing some Indian films at Bangalore to recommend the Indian entry for the Oscar Awards. The division bench observed that the earlier injunction order prohibiting the exhibition of the film privately or publicly in India in no way prevented its screening outside India. Poolan Devi, on whose life the Bandit Queen is reportedly based, had moved court alleging that the film depicted her in bad light, which could affect the criminal cases pending against her. The capital's Vadera Art Gallery last week displayed 33 breathtaking paintings of the Bangladesh-born artist Shahabuddin. Mammoth in size and stunning in impact, Shahabuddin's creations in colour and oil provide a window to his restless spirit and imagination, irrevocably shaped by the traumatic birth of his homeland. Prestigious gold medals and several awards have brought international fame to this extraordinary artist based in Paris for the past 20 years. It was a cricket tie only a die-hard film fan would have liked to see. Delhi's Firosha Kotla was the venue of the Film Stars Cricket War, a charitable match organised last week by the Navy Wives Welfare Association. Stars like Juhi Chavla, Jackie Shroff, Nasiruddin Shah, Amrish Puri and Prem Chopra regaled a crowd of 8,000 with their histrionics with the ball and bat. Adding to the frolic were their antics on and off the field.
South Indian film megastar Chiranjeevi makes another attempt at conquering Bollywood with his home production, The Gentleman, a film directed by Mahesh Bhatt, which was released this week. The film, which is a remake of the Tamil original of the same name, also stars the reigning superstar Juhi. I've been watching the videos and you've seen them on video. It's, it's like really happening to see them live performing and Malkit Singh with his music. And to watch him live is, is like really something good. Punjab was hardly ever known for its musical export. However, Malkit and later Apache Indian firmly put the state on the map of world music. It was Apache who was setting the discos alight with his rap songs, and Chok There, with several pilfered Indian versions, was no doubt a great hit. Coincidentally, both Apache and Malkit trace their antecedents to Jalandhar in Punjab. This is me, the original Dana Raja Ragamuffin from England. Watch out, Apache in The new single, Churaliya which I'm sure you've all seen the video of. Um, we'll be playing you new songs from Bollywood Flashback, this new album we've just released. And uh, we're looking forward to a nice show tonight. However, for Malkit, this visit is only a precursor of things to come. Come February, he's coming back. For every uh, 28 go uh, Bombay, Maharashtra, after that, Hopefully, either Delhi may be Oga, Chandigarh may be Punjab, maybe I'm choking. Or both Vadia Trike, Ache Trike, where Log Range Garra. The sheer body of Malkit's songs and the fervor of his renditions have caught the imagination of the new generation. And surely, this mix of folk tradition, reggae, pop, and electronic gimmickry will provide a heady flavor that will pump up the adrenaline. 21 year old Miss India runners up Aishwarya Rai went on to complete a unique double for India by winning the Miss World crown at Sun City in South Africa this week. A student of architecture, Aishwarya is a top model in the country today. Earlier this year, Sushmita Sen had bagged the Miss Universe title.